Reading is just a habit you gotta form in all of life. Books don't change people's sentences. Reading good, solid, reform, Puritan literature, reading especially the classic, that's had the biggest impact on my life. G'day, Tom here from Reformers Bookshop with another episode of the Reformers Bookcast, a podcast put on by Reformers Bookshop. My name is Tom Eglinton, the manager here at Reformers, and today we have a special guest with us, Cam Klausing. Hi. Thanks for joining us, Cam. Good to be here. Uh, now, Cam, uh, why don't you introduce yourself, tell us what you're all about. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, my name is Cameron Klausing. I am the lecturer in applied theology and missional engagement at Christ College which is the uh, training college of the Presbyterian Church of Australia in the state of New South Wales. I've just learned this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, I mean, my, my title is really just a, uh, uh, a fancy way of saying that I teach everything that the principal at the college wants me to teach. So, That's fair enough. Yeah. So um, my, ha- my, my wife and I are um, newly transplanted to Australia, though my wife is from uh, South Australia, Adelaide, and uh, has a long history with you and your family. And then um, I'm from the States originally. So, yeah, that's me Sounds in a like nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you also have an interest in Herman, Herman Bavinck. Yeah. Um, what, what led to that interest and what have you done with him? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what have we done with him? He's disappeared. Um, <laughs> No, uh, my uh, my PhD was in uh, Bavink, uh, particularly looking at his uh, theological method. So, how does he form his uh, his theological system? And uh, and I looked at that in conjunction with his Trinitarian theology. So, worked at the University of Edinburgh with James Eglinton and uh, wrote my thesis, which is in the process of um, being accepted for publication. Um, and then I've also translated a couple volumes, uh, Bavink's Sacrifice of Praise, which is meditations uh, uh, before and after one takes the Lord's Supper for the first time. And then uh, a forthcoming book with Hendrickson uh, called uh, Instruction in the uh, Christian, uh, I'm sorry, Guidebook in the Instruction of uh, Christian Religion. I, I just use the Dutch uh, title handlighting when I'm when I'm talking okay. about it and then I, and what I'm, what's that one about it's a, a short systematic theology uh, Bob Inc. wrote for um, for high schoolers really um, in the in the late early 20th century so um, it's a really helpful book on how to teach high schoolers and early college students uh, theology so it's an even smaller version of his reform dogmatics um, uh, so so that it's a one volume systematic. It's really, really a great book. And and so he's got his four volume reform dogmatics. He's got the wonderful works of God, which yep. is a fairly large one volume. Yep. And then this one's even smaller. This again. one's an even smaller version of that with, uh, with new content uh, in it. Uh, it's, it's really similar to wonderful works of God, but also has new content in it as well. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. It's a great book. Um, and tell, tell me about Bavink's theological method. Okay. What, yeah, yeah, explain that to me. Yeah, so I mean, um, so really, what he what he does is he puts together what what I like to call a, a three legs a three legged stool, um, in that he sees uh, scripture, church tradition, and uh, and the individual person uh, being uh, the person's experience in the world being a uh, all things that lead into b- uh, building a theology, right. and that you need all three of those. So you need to understand. Uh, scripture, obviously, it's the foundation for understanding theology. But you, you also don't abstract yourself from the the life of the church uh, historically. And then finally, um, the fact that you live in a different time and place than other Christians have, and you're, you yourself are a different person than other Christians, uh, are all necessary for building uh, a theology and a dogmatic theology in particular. So. What's a, what's a dogmatic theology? So dogmatic theology is what the church believes. Right. So um, what the church has believed at all times and all places, and then uh, and then um, brought into what a particular church believes at a, in a particular time and place. So w- how is that a different method to how other people would come up with a theology? I mean, in, in a lot of ways, it's not super different, but what... Um, but what Bavink does that's, uh, I mean, unique is that he's uh, his 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 portion his part on on uh, the personality of a person uh, of the one who is doing theology is quite important, 
uh, he he spends a lot of time thinking through what does it mean that I am doing theology or that mm-hmm. my church is doing theology in this particular time and place, which means, uh, I mean, it really goes back to the idea that we should be uh, the church reformed, always reforming, um, which uh, is something that we talk about a lot now, but was some was the way in which Bavink and other people in that uh, late 19th, early 20th century were thinking about that phrase, uh, the church reformed, always reforming, uh, was unique to that time and place. Um, it's not it's not the way Calvin would understand Reformation, hmm. but it is the way that um, the late 19th century, early 20th century starts to understand it. So it's um, so that's really the unique uh, way in which Bavink starts to speak into um, theology and really starts to develop how we understand theology now. So does, does that essentially mean that as the society around us changes and and moves and i guess you you see that particularly with technological advances that our theology has to um expand or enrich and to cover those aspects yeah uh, yeah i mean one needs to always be careful about saying that our theology changes That's why i didn't say exactly <laughs> um but but the idea is that we need to be able to express it in a different way and and incorporate these new uh ideas we don't unthinkingly bring in uh, the culture around us. We need to, uh, we need to be looking at our culture and critically de- deciding, like, what is it trying to make us do? I, I love um, Jamie Smith and his uh, cultural liturgies, and one of the things that he really helps us to understand is that culture is trying to make us worship something, mm. and thus, when we uncritically adopt culture into the into our um, church or into our theology without thinking through what is it trying to make me worship, we bring in, we start to bring in syncretism. And I think that same thing is true. Uh, and that's what, really what Bob Inc. is trying to get at as well, is like we need to critically think about the fact that the world is trying to make us do something. Um, how do we bring in the treasures of Egypt, as Augustine would say, without, um, without also bringing in all of the idols mm-hmm. of Egypt? Well, that's that's very helpful. But I didn't bring you here today to speak about Bavink, yeah. um, primarily. Well, that was I, I could talk about it forever. So <laughs> maybe another time. But uh, I, I asked you to to bring along a book of your choice, and one of the ones that you've uh, you've found particularly helpful yeah. is the Crook in the Lot. Um, do you want to introduce this book book to us? Yeah. So this is a this is a great book written by Thomas Boston. He was uh, a Puritan. Um, I believe that. Jonathan Edwards says that he is one of the greatest divines uh, to to have lived. Um, lived in the, uh, the the bridge between the 17th and 18th century. Um, was a pastor. Was a theologian. Um, was uh, the the joke uh, amongst uh, Puritan scholars is that what uh, what what is a peer, what is a pre- what is the job of the pastor but to teach teach and teach, mm-hmm. um, and and that's really what Boston does in this book in particular. He talks about suffering, which I, I've been I've said over and over again is one of those really. Um, I mean, when it comes to the, when it comes to the Puritans, they're they're just masterful at it. I mean. They, I, I said to a student the other day, they lived before penicillin existed. Um, so to cut your finger on a piece of paper was a life-threatening uh, illness. But uh, Boston's life in particular was quite, was quite fascinating because Boston um, suffered from chronic pain mm. uh, later in his life, was, uh, w- was in, in his day and age would be... Uh, talked about as having what's called melancholy, which is probably some form of de- depression. Yeah. His wife had chronic uh, illnesses and most likely also some mental illnesses from what from what we can read in some of his writings. They had 10 children, six of whom died. Um, so he's writing about uh, pain and suffering in the world in this book from a very experiential, like mm. he knew pain and suffering. So this book, uh, this book, The Crook in the Lot, um, is talking about how um, th- those times in our lives where, or, or those things in our lives that the Lord has given us that has uh, bent our life. Um, crook meaning something that's bent, bent no, and lot, lot being a, a stick, basically. So it's a bend and a stick. And, and asking the question, what do we do? How do we live with this? Um, do uh, what? What does it mean to uh, to live in a world wherein we have crooks in our lot? 
Um, so, uh, and, and he ends up saying like, look, there is no, there, he says with, uh, with Rutherford, I love the Samuel Rutherford Mm. line that, um, my, uh, my faith has no bed upon which to sleep, but the omnipotence of God. And and this is really where, uh, Boston lands as well. He says, look, life is hard and we all have crooks in our lot. It's tempting for us to judge each other's and say, well, yours isn't nearly as bad as mine. But in the end, we all have them. And the only place we can go is to the sovereign hand of God. Mm. And this is, I mean, really a counterintuitive way in which to live um, in our day and age. I mean, in our day and age, when we experience suffering, uh, our immediate question is, why would God do this to me? Yeah, yeah. And and Boston is saying that that's the wrong place to go. So. We'll, we'll dig into that in a minute. So when, when I heard that you were bring along this book, I thought I would bring along a book as well. Uh, this one is Notes from a tilt Well uh, by Andy Wilson. And it's coming at, a, at the same or a similar question from a very different angle. Yes, it's, <laughs> I remember reading it the first time and thinking that same thing. Yeah, so he's, um, he's a fiction writer and so it, it reads um, very... It's a fun read yeah. and he uses his words well. But he essentially comes at the problem of... of uh, suffering and evil in the world um, from the perspective of God as artist, mm. God as, as the, um, the story writer, the author of, of yeah. our creation, which is essentially a different way of saying the sovereign yeah. uh, work of God. And um, he, he pitches that the crooks in our lot are what makes our lot interesting. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's never a good story unless there's drama, unless there's difficulty to, that needs to be overcome unless there's character stories, yeah. uh, backstories, and he really opens your eyes to the hugeness of the world um, as well as God's care for your little tiny section of it with yeah. your comparatively little and tiny sufferings. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's quite helpful in that regard of having both that dual perspective of, well, God does care for my particular suffering um, and he's in, in control of it, um, but there's also a bigger story going on, and it, we need to have both of those perspectives as we live through this life. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember um, I gave that book actually to my brother-in-law, who is not a Christian, and uh, and have we had some great conversations about it. He's he's very artistic, uh, so he he, uh, he said that he walked away from it. Like it was it was a it was a really impactful book for him. Mm. I'm still not a Christian, but uh, but it was. I, for him, it, it raised a lot of questions that he hadn't uh, that he hadn't thought about, and I, it also reminded me of Tolkien's uh, Cimmerillion, right. where uh, where he's talking about creation and the and and, and uh, the creation of Middle Earth and how like um, basically the Satan figure is trying to disrupt the creation, but what when when creation is done after like all these dis, uh, discordant notes uh, come in. Um, uh, the the angels go down and see what what the what the Lord has made even even in the midst of the discord and it's still this beautiful creation yeah. uh, where you have these these things that have been that have been sovereignly brought into the plan that that um, you th- that seem like they weren't I, 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 it's a it's a great way to think about it from uh, Wilson's perspective yeah yep yeah. um, and I mean one of the things that Wilson talks about elsewhere is uh, the the fact that even in the Garden of Eden where you have perfection, it's not without trial. Yeah. It's not without difficulty. In the middle of perf- perfect Eden, yeah. what do you find? A dragon that yeah. needs that needs fighting. Yeah. And of course, we, our, our forefather and mother didn't fight very well, but yeah. but they should have. That's That was God's story for them. It yeah. involved difficulty even in perfection. Yeah, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, uh, one of the things that... Um, that Boston does that I think is really helpful is that constant reminder that um, we don't we don't run away from the sovereignty of God in the midst of our in the midst of our suffering and at the same time um, what we fix our hope on is 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 what the writer of Hebrews says that 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 uh, city that that's builder and found, founder is is the Lord yeah. And, uh, and, and thus we, we fix our eyes on that, on, on that with hope going, okay, the Lord has given me this and he's going to use it for the purpose of that, uh, of bringing me there. Um, and, and I think that that's, I mean, we're in, uh, Wilson is being much more artistic. Um, I mean, Boston is, 
is a master with words, but he's a master with words and trying to really give us a theological mm-hmm. and biblical uh, undergirding for that hope that we um, that that we're looking forward to. So, so let's press down into that a little bit. Um, well, I guess first we should probably talk about what is suffering. Mm. Um, we we often like to say that our our lives involve suffering. Yeah. Um, how, from your experience, I guess, and your perspective, what what as how would you define suffering? How would you view suffering in in the life uh, of a Christian? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you can look at suffering from from many different angles. I, I, I mean, I do think that anything that uh, wherein like we can look at it and go, this isn't the way it's supposed to be is, uh, is, is a form of suffering. So, I mean, anything from the big things that Boston goes through and that, and that Wilson uh, will go through in his life. Um, but the big things from, I mean, probably suffering kidney stones and uh, depression, um, losing children. Those are, I mean, that's obvious suffering. But yeah. I, I also think the people that have people that have uh, chronic uh, back pain. Mm-hmm. I think, I think not getting like having a boss that's really hard is yeah. a, is a relational form. difficulty. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, we all experience suffering in some in some form. Um, f- friendships breaking down. Financial um, pressures, financial pressures, having to wear masks when uh, when you don't want to wear a mask. Like, th- I mean, in a sense, like these are all things that we sit down and go, like, yeah, there is suffering in this world. I mean, I think we're, we're I mean, we're in the midst of a world right now with a pandemic going on where there's immense suffering. Um, even when we have the little things, those little inconveniences to life, those are ways in which we suffer. I, I mean, I, I can talk about what uh, what Boston's prescription is in those in those in the midst of even those little things, but we'll we'll talk about that in a second, I'm sure. <laughs> well, that I think that's sort of where we where we need to go now. So, because um, God has obviously placed suffering in our life, so we, mm-hmm. we're gonna, we're going to assume the sovereignty of God. He's all powerful, and he's all uh, he has control over every tiny itty bitty detail of our life, um, down to the the pimple that's painting our nose um how what's his purpose in our suffering um what 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 does boston bring to light in in those aspects yeah i mean i think there's a lot of things that boston talks about uh but the one thing that constantly that i'm constantly brought back to that that boston points us to is the fact that uh the first response should be a humbling of us. Mm. Like we, 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 when, when we experience suffering, what we realize is that we are not God. Um, so often, I mean, especially in our day and age, it's so often, uh, it's so easy to believe that, that we're God. It's so easy to believe that, that I can figure it out, that I've got this under control and, or at least that you have, you have a better idea of what would be best for you. Yeah. <laughs> And, and and I think that um, I think that what suffering does is it imme- it's that it's that wake up call that oh I I'm not actually uh, I'm not actually God here. Yeah. Um, I think it was Lewis who says that uh, God sc- shouts at us in our pain, and I think that we like what what Boston is saying here is that God in 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 those moments of suffering in those crooks in our lot in the thorn in our flesh as Paul would say. Uh, it's God. It's God calling us to humble ourselves before Him and remember mm. that He's the sovereign one. He is the one that has given this to us. Yeah, w- Wilson puts it in terms of um, he he sort of has a whole chapter where he talks about Hamlet, yeah, having a go at Shakespeare, yeah, and saying, "Well, you're not, you're a rubbish author. In fact, I don't even think you're an author, yeah, because <laughs> there's so much difficulty in my life. So many people have died, and I, yeah, it's just this list story sucks, yeah." <laughs> But the reality is that he doesn't have that right because yeah. Shakespeare's writing his story, yeah, um, and he has to he has to sort of live with it in yeah. that in that sense and and learn that that's not his place. His place is to to be the character. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the things that Boston brings out that's really that's really helpful is that like because God is writing this story, because God is the one that is that is sovereign over it. There is meaning behind it. It's not pointless. It's not meaningless uh, suffering. We aren't sitting there. We aren't sitting there having to think to ourselves, oh, well, there's, um, there, we aren't having to try to come up with our own meaning because, but, but the God is using this for a purpose, which once again goes back to the idea that God is bringing us to that, um, to that celestial city. Like yeah. he's bringing, he's, he's bringing us to an end, uh, for which he has created us and he's using this to bring us there. 
Um, so, so how does that work? So suffering, right, rightly um, perceived by the Christian should, or, you, or anyone, should humble us under the mighty hand of, hand of God. How does that drive us to the celestial city? Yeah, I mean, I think that what, what it does, at least as Boston's prescription, is that it, it drives us to prayer. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it points us to the fact that God can, um, he can straighten the crook if he wants. Yep. He can choose not to. And as we're, as we're driven to prayer, uh, as we're driven to, uh, to the Father and, uh, and remembering the work of the Son, we, we, through the work of the Holy Spirit, are conformed to the image of Christ and allowed to continue down that uh, pilgrimage toward, uh, toward heaven. Um, it's when we, it's when we uh, fight against the crook in our lot and we go, okay, well, this is horrible. Like the, the, um, the Lord obviously didn't know what he was doing. He's, he's wrong in this, uh, that, that, uh, Boston would say that we miss the, we miss the point of, of what, of why the Lord has given this to us. Mm. And, and that in fact, it's, it's helpful for us to grow up. Um, it's, it's good for us to be there. It's, it's that, um, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a big believer that in the midst of our pain and suffering, it's not helpful to have somebody come to you and like start quoting Romans eight, like, you know, the Lord is going to make this all good. Um, but it's something that, that, uh, we scream out in the midst of our, in the midst of our pain and suffering that, that in the midst of suffering, we, we look at the Lord and we go, I don't know why you've given this to me, but I do know that you will turn it to my good. So Lord, help me to believe that. And, and that's so important. I think that, um, as, as Christians, all of us, would say that we want to be conformed to the image of Christ. We want to be like Jesus. Yeah. And yet, one of the most important things, possibly the most important thing that Jesus did, was he was obedient in suffering. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're doing a series at our church at the moment on the seven sayings of the Savior on the cross. And just yesterday, we, we heard a sermon on, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. This deep anguish of Christ as he goes through more intense suffering than any of us could possibly imagine. Yeah. And yet what's his what's his cry? It's yeah. not it's not my god my god you can't exist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or this is unfair. It's it's a a reference to the psalm mm. where the psalmist has this deep hope in God that he is working even through this suffering to bring about his own glory. Yeah, I mean it's it's a beautiful thing when you think about it like that the Lord I mean, that the Lord chooses to use this. I mean, yeah. it's not meaningless. Like, like your suffering isn't meaningless. It's not purposeless, uh, but there's a purpose to it. It's, uh, we, we, we sing pretty songs about like the refiner's fire and that we want to be like Jesus, but a fire hurts. Yeah. Um, I, I said to my students the other day, like uh, we talk about dying to sin and if anybody stood by somebody's bedside as they died, it's not a pleasant experience. Mm. Death is actually quite painful, and, and the body doesn't want to die, and, and thus, and, and and thus we we shouldn't be surprised when we are dying to sin that it's actually a painful process that that this actually hurts, mm. um, and, and and yet we think that to be conformed to Jesus, uh, to the image of Christ, to be. Uh, to die to sin, to live unto righteousness, to um, to be refined in the refiner's fire should be fairly painless for us. Uh, and yet all of those images are painful images. That's right. And, and so I think that, um, I mean, that suffering is used uh, for the purpose of, of, refining us and bringing us, uh, bringing us into that image. And I think we miss the point when we start to, when we don't read those images and actually understand like, this is actually like quite painful. Yeah. And that kind of, that sort of brings us back to a point you made earlier, which is that in, in our suffering, the, the goal is that we're driven to the feet of our mm. God, um, crying out to him for mercy, for grace, yeah. for, um, courage. Yeah. Um, just for, comfort yeah um and that i think is so important i think it's something that i've i've seen over over and over again in terms of what the christian life's all about yeah you could you could sum it up as dependence upon god Mm. um uh yeah so in terms of of i guess wrapping this all up in a little bundle um as as we're going through 
those little trials or those big trials in life, what what advice have you found f- from Boston um, that's been, I guess, the, the most impactful? Yeah, I, I mean, so this is a book of six sermons, um, and, and I think just that uh, that remi- reminder that um, there is a season for everything. I mean, the, the first sermon is based on uh, Ecclesiastes 7.13, consider the work of God who can make straight uh, which he hath made crooked. Mm. And it's that reminder that we can't actually fix the crook in our own lot. There are seasons for these things. Um, I mean, the, the writer of Ecclesiastes is obviously asking a rhetorical question because the answer is, well, nobody can make straight what God has made crooked yeah, yeah. Uh, other than the Lord himself. And so it's a, it's a constant reminder to me in my own life as I walk with my family, as I, as I uh, do the work of the college, um, that, that ultimately um, in those moments where I feel my mortality more than others, that, that uh, I need to humbly rely upon the Lord, trust that he has given me this thing, that, that he's a good father who's given me good gifts, even the good gifts that seem hard at, the mo- at that moment. Yeah, I and mean, that's a great, um, great line that, that really sums up one of the main points I think that I, I took out of this book, um, which is that we we see suffering and we say, well, there's there's no, this is bad. It's not good for me. Whereas mm. really the question is, um, my my author has put suffering in my life. Mm. What is it that, how how is it that I'm meant to act out this mm. scene? So that I bring glory to Him, mm-hmm. and so I'm not just the the um, the guy in the story who's a a, <laughs> a moral tale of what not to do. Yeah. You know, how do I how do I experience the the depth of the how bad it is, yeah. whilst also rejoicing in the fact that it's written by my heavenly Father. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, Cam, it's been great. Thank you for coming and joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. And this has been the Reformers Bookcast. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and we will see you next time.